Duncan Redoubt. I'm one of the two leaders of the RPA. Which, if somebody's coming at it fresh, totally, and they're trying to understand how an orchestra works, how would you describe what you do? You have to be multifaceted in a way. You've got to be able to uh, deal with people a lot of the time, um, and amongst those people, obviously, one very important factor is getting on with conductors, making things work. But I suppose, really, I'm a bit of a foreman for the for the section, a coordinator, and uh, you know, decisions have to be made. Um, I don't need to tell any of my colleagues how to do what they do, but I can tell them how we're going to do what we're going to do from the, for, the, for the sake of consistency and, and you know, doing it all the same way. So I'm guessing in practical terms, you need to know all the orchestra members extremely well, and you have to get a measure of the conductor pretty quickly as well. Are you acting almost like a translator? In a way, yes, because uh, we work with uh, different conductors day in, day out. Um, and the upshot of that is that, of course, all these conductors have different styles, and yet we have to find a communal way of reacting to that style. And if we all do our sort of own thing about reacting, you, you could end up with uh, something that's a little bit, well, lacking in unanimity. So I suppose in a way I am interpreting that. So uh, it's very difficult to define. A lot of the time people say, oh, well, yeah, I've been watching the orchestra, and it seems that a lot of people watch you. Well... Uh, it doesn't mean they're not watching the conductor, but there's a certain, you know, there are certain aspects of what we do and how we do it that I coordinate probably by my body language, and of course because they're used to either having me or, or Cleo, the other leader there, it's it's a consistency that the orchestra can plug into, however however varied, you know, that the the style of conducting is from day to day. I'm guessing there's no real standard orchestra member. I guess you have to, some are going to be young, some are going to be coming into the orchestra, mm -hmm. they're going to be fairly fresh at uh, trying to understand how the orchestra works, and there's going to be some old hands mm -hmm. who may feel as though they know better than everybody else. So uh, are you a diplomat? Uh, I hope my colleagues will feel that I am diplomatic, yes. I think it's very important. Because it's very important to, uh, in, a, in a key position, it's very important that your colleagues uh, understand and trust you, trust your motives, and also... Uh, that they want to work with you. So um, the way I approach what we do is hopefully never confrontational. I mean, it doesn't need to be, really, because it's very, very rarely yeah, anything that needs much discussion at all. You know, it's because it's, it's a, a smooth way of working, we have to work fast, and it works very efficiently. You mentioned that they're watching you. They're watching you for... Cues for mood or for timing or for... I think, time, I think timing, possibly. As I say, because the style of beat from uh, different conductors would be so varied, I think it's the timing thing that, that, that uh, I will provide when needed for, for the rest of the players. Because, you know, they know, as, as my bow approaches the string, you know, everybody knows my body language because I'm there a lot of the time. And therefore, um, that timing issue can be sorted without taking any of our attention away from what the conductor is thinking of in a, mu you know, in a musical sense or whatever. Sometimes you know, it can be, uh, it's best just to leave it to the beat. It, it depends. It changes every day. Well, I have met some leaders who have had to, I don't know if it's the right way, step in if perhaps the, the musicians weren't getting enough messages from a conductor. Mm -hmm. Does that happen very often, or does it depend on the conductor, or, the, or how it, the conductor's feeling on the day, maybe? It depends on the conductor. I have to say, it doesn't happen very often. Um, you're talking about a, sort of a misunderstanding, aren't you, between conductor and player? Well, it's a difficult uh, channel of communication, I would have thought. Because sometimes, uh, I don't know how much time you get with a conductor, but sometimes they may be straight off an aeroplane, mm -hmm. they walk straight into the hall, they're standing in front of mm -hmm. you, and mm -hmm. it's a blank sheet between you and the conductor. Mm -hmm. That's that must be a very difficult situation to handle. Uh, it can be, but uh, the, mo uh, the motivation for the musicians is always that we have to make this work. You know, we're not interested in you know, having a little bit of fun <laughs> and making life difficult. You know, the, the, it's always that we've got to make this work and make it work as, as, as efficiently as possible. And actually, the, that kind of situation really is very, very rare. Do you remember the first time that you were conscious of the kind of music that you were going to come to play later? At the age of, I think, of seven, we had a um, quite a 
quite an old guy come to the house. He came about three times, and I hated him so much, I said, right, I'm never playing this thing again. I'm just not going to do it. And so my parents gave it a couple of years before they found me a nice young lady teacher who was much more gentle and understanding. And I was bribed with... Uh, every time we went for a lesson, on the way home, we went to the fish and chip shop. And I got a bag of chips. So that's where it all started, really. So you got into music, but you were bribed into becoming a musician. Bribed into going to violin lessons, yeah. And that sort of set the tone for the rest of your musical well, career. Well, it did, yes. <laughs> yeah. I got to the age of... Um, when we moved down to uh, Dorset, uh, where my father became head of music at the uh, College of Further, Further Education in Poole, um, obviously uh, that, that was a new environment, and it came to my father's notice that there was a, a London violin professor living in Bournemouth. Uh, he moved down to Bournemouth after... I don't know how many heart attacks, and he'd been told by his doctors he should move down to Bournemouth and stop teaching. So he moved down to Bournemouth and kept teaching in London, which probably defeated the purpose. But my father made contact with this guy, and uh, I went along to play to him, and uh, he gave me a very honest appraisal of where I was and what I was doing on the violin, which was so depressing I wanted to give up. He really tore me apart. And then even worse than that, he decided, uh, I'm going to try and experiment. I've never taught anybody as elementary as you, but I'm just going to give it a go. And that was where everything kicked off, because my, my progress from that point was uh, relatively startling. And it was, then I was on this sort of fast-moving conveyor belt of, of progress um, that I never managed to get off. Did you ever feel as if you wanted to get off that conveyor belt, or did you feel, this is right for me, I, I, I'm going to create a career in music? I think as a young musician, uh, well, probably not just a mu musician, I think when you're learning a skill and you sense that you, your progress is so rapid, it feeds upon itself and you become enthusiastic about the fact that all the time you're finding yourself more able to do things and, um, that only a short time ago were impossible or difficult. And, and so that... Uh, that creates a lot of enthusiasm. So it just fed upon itself, really. And there was no point at which I had decided I want to be a, a, a musician. It just it just happened. And and as it happened, I thought, well, I'm, I'm fine with this. You know, I'm very happy doing this. I love music. And but there wasn't a, it wasn't a particular point at which uh, I said. And I've, I've got a lot of colleagues who remember the time when they say, I decided I wanted to be a musician. And I think music just happened to me because of circumstances. So there was no one point where I decided it just happened to me, and I'm very happy about it. Was the next step in the process always obvious? Because I guess that you, you had those early lessons, mm -hmm. and then did you go into a conservatoire after that? Or? Well, I, I was 11 when I started with uh, Nick Roth, a professor who was at Trinity College. So uh, when it came time to go up to London, uh, I went to Trinity College to continue my studies with him. And in fact... Um, even in the later years when I'd left college, uh, on leaving college, uh, we formed a, a string called Tet. Uh, three of us, the top three, the two violins and the viola, we were all pupils of Nick Roth. We formed a quartet called, in his name, the Roth Quartet. And uh, we took coaching from him as well. So my association with him actually, and towards the end on and off, lasted about 14 years. The problem was I kept saying to myself, hey, isn't it time to break away? But every time I went to see this guy and sat down and started working on things, I, I just learned so much. And I thought it was ridiculous. If you're learning so much, why, why look for a new path? And the most valuable thing that he ever gave his pupils was the ability to uh, teach yourself, to criticize what you're doing. And, and to, you know, because it's very easy to sort of hear what you want to hear when you're practicing. And he gave us the ability to be super critical and to apply certain techniques to solving problems. So I like to think that the, the biggest gift he gave me was the ability to teach myself. Very often, once people have got to that stage, there's a gap before they find a, a full-time place, maybe in an orchestra. Mm -hmm. Did you have any problems crossing that gap? Um, or again, was it quite obvious how the process was going? Uh, I think things are slightly different now, but when uh, at the time I was coming out of music college, uh, it was a very common thing to do to freelance, so you made yourself some contacts. And I went to play to Harry Blech at, uh, and 
subsequently started working a lot with the London Mozart players, the same with uh, Neville Marinette. I was working with the Academy. And uh, the quartet that we had was also taking a lot of time as well. So that, you know, that was more than enough. So I was working in the profession. I was working in the, the chain, music, chain music situation, which I think taught me a, an awful lot. Uh, so, no, there was never a time when I was uh, twiddling my thumbs. You mentioned chamber there, yeah. which is, uh, some people feel is a very different skill from working in an orchestra. You don't mind you go backwards and forwards between the two? I don't get much time to play chamber music now. Um, they are very different skills, uh, but I think, um, from my own experience, the time that I spent in the string quartet uh, was invaluable to uh, the skills that it's now felt that I bring to leading a, a full symphony orchestra. I, I, I say that yeah, during the, my quartet years, it was when I learned how to lead. Obviously, a symphony orchestra is a bit bigger. I mean, it's a bit of a, a larger vehicle to be trying to have an influence over, but um, at least they don't bite back as much as other quartet players do. Listening to you, it's very t tempting to actually say, well, the rest is history, because mm -hmm. you encompass so much already mm -hmm. in what you've just said. But then, of course, we go on to working with some of the, the biggest orchestras in the country, with some oh. of the, the biggest names, the conductors uh, in, in music today. Mm -hmm. If you could pick out uh, specific moments where you thought, this is, this is fabulous, you know, I, I have reached my nirvana, I'm working with the most fabulous people mm -hmm. in, the, in perfect place, perfect music, does anything spring to mind? What you aspire to is a situation where you are working with somebody who has an unsurpassed knowledge of the piece and an ability to communicate it. You've had a situation where you've had the time to um, with, working with that person on that repertoire to really dig deeper than you know a couple of days rehearsal can provide. And uh, you're asking me that I think that the, the prom that the RPO did this summer. Uh, the second half of which we did La Mer and uh, Daphnis and Chloe, suite number two, with Charles Dutois, which we'd done a lot on tour, a lot on tour. And that f felt as good as it gets, because you were, uh, we were so immersed in that interpretation with Charles. That, that, for me, that, that's you know, what we all aspire to. But there are, I remember a time, I was in the first years of the what was called then the uh, ECYO, European Community Youth Orchestra, it's probably got a different name now, European Union Youth Orchestra or something. Um, but uh, that was at the time when I was still at college, uh, and we kicked that off in 1978, and we had, I think, something like 10, 12 days of rehearsal with Claudio Bardo in Holland before touring all the capitals of Europe with Mars 6. And it was such an exciting project to be part of, and... Uh, I look back on that now, and I know I'm very much not alone in, in seeing that as a situation where you thought, maybe this is what it's going to be like. And it can't be like that all the time. You just can't. You know. It's like hoping, you know, you've gone to a good party, you, you hope you can make another party like that. And you, you, can't re you can't create these things, they just sometimes happen. But that was really, that was really quite an experience. Party or a pub crawl? Because I mean, the, uh, now I don't mean in, that in alcoholic terms, but I mean you, you go on tour, mm -hmm. don't you? And you enjoy going on tour, and that's mm -hmm. part of the job, isn't it? You have to be aware that you could end up in China, you could end up in the Far East, in, in the States, in South America. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, we're sitting in the Cadogan Hall at the moment, which is a, a spiritual home, I guess, of the RPO. Would you? Which which do you prefer? Do you like it to, to get out there, to get on the road, and, and to be travelling? I think the mixture is so good at the RPO. It's just a mixture of everything. I wouldn't want to be on tour all the time. Um, I love playing opera. I wouldn't want to be playing opera all the time. We just, we've got such a fantastic mix that, uh, you know, you never think, I want to be doing more of this or less of that or whatever. It's just a great mix. So I love going on tour, but what we do is, is about the right amount. It's great. <laughs>